Good afternoon. Can you hear me from the back? Yes, perfect. The door has been closed, so the last session, no one can get out. That's it. This is the end. But we have a very interesting topic. I'm not over-promising anything, but you are in very, very competent hands. And it's about, it's not about Tin Can and XAPI, un unlike what it says on the program. So are you ready to be a part of demystification of Tin Can and XAPI? Are you ready? to take control of how you would like to use your data, how you would like to manage your data. And as, as well, are you ready to really demand, put demands to your vendors on what you would like them to design for you? So in this session, we're going to cover as many parts and pieces of the, these questions as possible. So I would like to welcome Martin, oh, <laughs> brain freeze, <laughs> I'm sorry, Johnny, Johnny, and Aaron. <laughs> Everyone knows me now. So, please, say welcome, and I'll leave it to you guys. Okay, so thanks very much. First of all, sincerely thank you for staying. Right? You're already better people than all those people out there queuing up for coats and going down in the lift. So you are ahead of the game. All right? As far as we're concerned, you're great people. Um, we're going to talk a little bit about the API economy, and we're going to talk a little bit about APIs and the importance of data and data science. And anybody who was at Donald, Donald who's just walked into the room, anybody who was at Donald's previous session on adaptive learning and AI? Any hands, show of hands? So this should be a, a kind of a follow-on to that session, right? Because most of what Donna was talking about in terms of data and the importance of data and how AI is going to change the way that we learn is dependent in many ways on APIs and successful implementation of APIs. I want to give you a little bit of a context, first of all, right? So I'm, I'm Martin Farris. I'm director of the Learn of Eight Center. What is the Learn of Eight Center? It's a, it's a center based in Dublin, in Ireland. Um, it's government-funded. We're hosted by Trinity College. And what we do is... We do applied innovation for industry partners based on research that we do with our research partners across the country. So this is going into sort of 20 years, really, of research around things like personalization, adaptive learning, um, speech recognition technologies, um, new, model, new models of assessment, and applying that in a kind of modern learning context. So that's who we are. We're a national uh, center for learning innovation. We work in very targeted ways with industry partners to help them to bring new technologies to the market. But what we also do is we look at kind of macro issues that we think we can get involved in in order to promote greater innovation in terms of technology and technology to support learning. And we feel that particularly, uh, how many vendors are in the room? Any vendors in the room? Okay, sorry about what I'm about to say. But we feel that particularly the state of the market at the moment, there, there could be more innovation. Lots of, lots of really good innovation happening, but there could be a lot more, particularly in the corporate learning space. We also do a lot of work in the school space, in the K-12 space, in the preschool space. There's a lot more innovation happening in that ed tech space for many reasons, but uh, we'd like there to be more in the corporate space. So we're going to talk a little about the API, API economy. What are APIs? Well, APIs, we use them every day. And, and in many ways, what APIs do is they, they actually improve the, the consumer and experience in terms of, of, of us being online. But they're really all about data. They're all about transactions, right? And it's, the, it's these transactions, this data passing between different web services and the kind of <coughs> the in, intrinsic value of those transactions that is referred to in terms of the API economy. Because you can put a commercial value on all of that data moving around. You can also put a kind of qualitative value on all of that data moving around. And that's the thing that's really important for, for learners. We're interested in these data points, right? Learners are creating lots of data, po data points, lots of devices, lots of ways they're interaction, interaction with, with material. And a lot of those data points are squandered, right? We lose them because a lot of systems, platforms are not interconnected. So we're going to talk a little bit today about um, how some of the work that we're doing to change that. And um, we're going to launch today. You'll be able to look back in 10 years' time and say, I was there on the day that they launched the Learnovate Labs initiative. This is going to be launched today in this room, here right now. 
myself and Johnny are going to talk a little bit about how the work that we've been doing in Learnovate over the last couple of years has led us to this point to launch this Learnovate Labs initiative. Thanks, Martin. Okay, so as Martin says, we're here at the last session, and the clicker which worked a few minutes ago is, uh, actually, there's a network screen that's come up here on the mic. Here we go. So, as it's the last session, and although we need to do some PowerPoint slides, we decided what we would do is do a bit of a role play for you guys. Um, that also helps because we're going to play uh, two imaginary characters. So I'm going to be Tim the technologist. So you all have me in your organization. I'm going to come up with all these wonderful innovative technology ideas. And Larry, the learning manager, is we're going to have a little struggle, as, as is probably something that you guys are all familiar with. It took us a long time to come up with those names. Yeah, yeah. A long time. <laughs> you got to go with personas, right? Everyone wants to have personas. So the other key thing about working in these roles is we're not speaking as Martin or Johnny. So that means we can say what we like about <laughs> the industry and uh, the vendors and everything, the challenges that we have within the industry. But it's an industry that we've been part of for 15, 20 years, both of us. So we, we know the challenges of trying to come up with a new technology that we all believe is going to have a profound change in learning and that we never quite deliver on all those things. So um, we're not saying that everything is going to be easy. We're just saying we think there's things happening now which can potentially transform the way you all deliver learning, but most importantly, the way the individuals learn. So, um, so what we're going to do is, I said, I'm going to be uh, over here as Tim the technologist. And I take an inside-out approach, right? So I'm all about the great technology that we have in our labs or in our, in our team. Uh, in our, in our, where the, as Steve Jobs says, like, you know, you guys don't know what you want until we show it to you. We're going to come up with these absolutely fantastic, innovative technologies. And what Larry's going to be saying is, hang on a second, I don't really care about the technology. All I care about is my learners. And, and if you're going to give me some technology you think is great, it only really works for me if it's going to provide value to our people and it's going to enable them to do their jobs better than our competitors. And that's really what we need to do to be able to deliver different experiences and different performance for our business. So I'm sure, again, you guys can recognize that challenge between the inside-out approach and the outside-in approach. And we're just going to roll with that um, for the role play today. So here we go. So now I'm, I'm no longer Johnny. I'm now Tim. I remember that. Hey, Larry. I got some really, really cool technologies. Your, your learners are going to love it. You say this every time, right? You bring out these new technologies. They never work. They never integrate with the LMS. How is this going to be different to the last time? Calm down. This time, it really is going to be different, right? Because we found these really cool APIs from these guys in Learnovate Labs. Another, another three-letter acronym, APIs. I don't, I'm not interested in APIs. Just tell me what they are. What's the API? OK, OK. Well, look, I'll tell you what I'll do. Why don't I talk you through an example, give you an example of how we can use these within our organizations, and let's see where we get to. OK, OK. okay. So you know why you're always hopping on about user-generated content? and expert curation. I'm not sure about the harping on bit yet, but I do go on a little bit about right, that okay. stuff, yeah. And we're a regulated industry, so we've got all these changes in the regulations, and we've got to get that message out as quick as we can. 600 salespeople all over the world, and when things change, we've got to get the message out there, compliant, but you know, yeah. effective and engaging. Yeah. That happens all the time, yeah. Okay, right, so here's the situation. This actually happened the other day. Those of you who are watching the EU Safe Harbor, the ring any bells, Privacy Shield, the new announcement, literally was, was on Tuesday night, I think it was. So I got an email about this at about 11 o'clock on Tuesday night. Had to get on to solicitors and say, what does that mean? And it's the same in this story. So Penny, in our product marketing team, she gets this email on the way to work uh, on the train. She gets the email, OK, this has been announced. I've got to get this message out to the 600 salespeople by lunchtime. So what am I going to do? So she takes her, her phone or her tablet. And she launches our new Knowledge Exchange app, which is just a little icon on her phone. She opens it up, types in the, the search phrase for the regulation, and hits go. So what happens next is that search phrase is pushed into this Learnovate API. And then what they can do is they can put that search together in the different ways that different systems are going to expect to search. And send that search out to Google and Bing, so you can get different search results. If you've noticed, you get different results from the two different search engines. Get, send the same search out to the LMS. Maybe we've got an existing course that I need to amend or, or update. But also, I can send the search out to 
the social networks, the public social networks, and see what since this morning, what the experts are saying about the new regulation, but also into our internal social network ourselves and see what our people are saying about this. So the one call goes out to all these different services and comes back and is presented to Penny in a federated way, which means basically the searches are all presented together for her. And she can then see what she wants on the train. Oh, how did I manage that? You're supposed okay. to be the technology guy in our organization. <laughs> there I'm you sure go. How that's going for you. Yeah. The user, it's the user interface on this, on this clicker. Yeah. Um, so she can tag and annotate the materials. Like she's still on the train, she's just flicking through the stuff, right? She's not building anything yet, she's just tagging and annotating them so when she gets back to her So that's desk. great as a research tool, but how is she then going to curate that content and get the content out to the 600 people in the field? Okay, so when she gets to her desk, right? So now she's in the office, she's already done her research, and this, this is where the next set of tools from these guys in Learnovate comes in. So they've spent over five years looking at the different tools that people need to pull content together. So they've got these dynamic composition tools, probably quite similar to the, what Donald described earlier on. So at her desk now, she's tagged and annotated this content. She can bring it all up, and very, very quickly, she can pull together the learning experience that she requires. But she can also make it personalized and adaptive for different people. So she can put more detail into the material if it's a compliance person who needs to get an update. Whereas the salespeople, they need what they need to know to close the deal. So she can make it that it literally adapts to the role, but also to people's levels. So if somebody is, is new to this material, they may have a little bit more introductory stuff in there. So, and then she can deliver all that from her desk. So now you've got me interested, but you're kind of sneaky because you've just introduced another three-letter acronym, the LRS. What's the LRS? Tell me about that. Okay, so, so LRS, and, and you may have heard of the, the four-letter acronym, XAPI, really exciting stuff, right? But Aaron over here knows a hell of a lot more than I do, so he's going to talk all about that in a few minutes. Okay, so... I can see how this works. So a lot of the content that we need to publish to our learners today is kind of real time. What we want to do is to make them more effective in the moment. It has to be dynamic, right? So I get that bit. So Penny's pulled this content together. She can deliver the course in real time using whatever kind of platforms we want. So it doesn't matter whether it's a video platform, Skype, YouTube, whatever. She can pull all of that together. Is that right? So that's how this is working. You got it. Okay. The easy so, as that. So, so that, doesn't that mean that all of these things have to just seamlessly interconnect with each other? And if I'm not mistaken, you know, that that kind of open ecosystem, open integration approach hasn't traditionally been a strong point in the learning technology space. There's a lot of silos of platforms. Right? So how is that going to work? You always find those weaknesses, don't you? Like it's, like, no, it, it's a fair cop. We're not there yet in terms of, of, of the seamless integrated experience. Um, the learning APIs that exist are emerging, but in a lot of cases, they're not quite plug and play yet. And it's not as easy as we'd like it to be for our developers to just use that to, to create these new learning experiences that they want. But things are changing. And I think some of that change is being driven by uh, technologies and, and, and uh, projects like what they're working on in Learnovate, where they're providing tools that will enable people to break out of the wall gardens of their existing LMS platforms. And there's some, some new and exciting smaller companies that are building these technologies into what they do from the outset. So, so my developers are able to take all of these technologies now and, and put them together. So what you're saying is we're going to see a lot more very specialized providers of, of very kind of narrow but really good solutions, all of which need to connect together to give a much better and kind of much more agile experience for learners but for learning organizations. Yeah, and it's, it's, it's creating that, that layer in between, which is, which is what the guys in Learnovate Labs are working on. And I, I don't know, I think on the next slide, I, I, I'm, I'm guessing, just giving you a prompt there to click, uh, the, oh, there it is. And so you've got, for example, third parties like Credly. So Credly is kind of, you know, micro-credentials. I'm going to use micro-credentials for my learners if they're going off and doing things. They may be they're doing some work which is not, it's more informal in terms of the learning, but I want to capture that. I want to be able to measure it. I don't want to use kind of narrow forms of measurement like SCORM. Can that help me do this kind of stuff as well? Yeah, and again, this is where the LRS and, and the XAPI stuff that, that Aaron's going to talk about will come in. And, and that's really key in terms of being able to, to measure the experience. But I think the most important thing for the learners is that, that experience that they have on their phone when the sales guys actually get the content is as close to the experience that they have when they're interacting with the technology in their lives. And this is the comment that Dave Kelly made yesterday. If we want learners to learn effectively, we have to make them, give them the tools and the experiences that are the same as the ones they use in the, to live their lives. So in this situation, the content can be pushed live to those learners if they're awake because they're in the right time zone. If they're asleep, it'll, they'll get the notification when they wake up. They can go back in. They can watch the experience. 
um, it, you know, after the fact, they can still engage with all the content. But most importantly, they can engage in the discussions and they can rate the materials and they can find through their group the people who've got the answers to the problem. The last thing that is really cool about what the guys in Learnavate are doing is, is they can put these filters on these so that, again, if you're an organization that maybe has um, proprietary information that you don't want, you want to make sure it doesn't go outside uh, your um, social networks, they've got options to embed that privacy in the front of the APIs. They're using that for kids as well so that the searches are appropriate for kids. So again, it's, it's a cross-sectoral approach that they have. Okay, so look, we're not going to challenge Idris Elba for acting ability, right? So that's the end of the, um, the role play, right? So, but, 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 you know, you get the message, right? We've given you a fairly narrow kind of slice through of one example of where APIs are really important in terms of trying to just drive innovation, agility, and change in terms of using technology to support learning, giving learners experiences that are much more related to the consumer experience. Can you just go on to the next slide? So one of the kind of recurring messages that's come through through a lot of the, the presentations that I've been at anyway over the last couple of days is this whole notion of data science, right? And that, and that we actually need to embrace data science as learning professionals not just as organizations, but as individuals as well, and actually take ownership of the data that we want to have about our learners and about our learning organizations. Because we should be deciding, well, what is the data model that I want for my organization to be able to map my kind of learning analytics against my organizational analytics, my learning competencies against my organizational competencies? For all of that to happen, we have to have this system of, or, or, or almost an open ecosystem of APIs. And what, what we have found in the work that we've been doing over the last couple of, of years in Learnovate is that there are three key factors that really need to be in place to make that open ecosystem work more effectively. The first one is data mobility, right? Data mobility, XAPI has a huge role to play in terms of data mobility. And anybody who thinks that XAPI is just an extension of SCORM, forget that. It's like comparing a horse with a Ferrari, right? It might get you to more or less the same um, ambition, but it's doing it in a very, very, very different way, right? The second point is privacy by design, right? Data protection, data privacy is huge with learners and learner data. By definition, data about learners is personal, and therefore you have to take into account data privacy, data protection. But if you do that from the beginning, if you build in privacy by design, you can build APIs that protect that all the way through. And the third thing is API usability, and this is a new area, right? You can make APIs usable for developers. They don't have to be kind of um, uh, almost inaccessible um, um, interfaces to, to plug into. And we've been doing some really interesting work about how, for example, you use color coding and APIs in order, to make, to, in order to make an API itself, the coding itself, more usable for developers. If you don't make them usable, developers won't take, take up your API and you will not get throughput of data. Right? So these are three really important factors that you need in order to make this kind of innovative open API ecosystem work. And once you can then plug in that kind of blue circle, or is it blue or purple? A uh, purple circle around the outside, you can get the, the app developers, the system integrators, the content providers, the platforms, the, the vendors to work together. But you get to dictate as the learners and the learner organizations because you understand the data, the data model that you want to achieve. You can get them to work according to your agenda because you want this system of open APIs. So that's how it works. We've set up um, a, an initiative called Learnovate Labs. Um, you can go to the website. There isn't a whole lot there, but there is a form where you can sign up to find out more information about how we're going to push this initiative forward over the next six to 12 months. We are not a commercial organization. We're not selling anything. What we're trying to do is to put in place an ecosystem, or at least the, the pieces of the ecosystem, that are going to make this open API model work more effectively and drive us towards the kind of vision that Donald was talking about in the previous session. So we're going to hand over now to Aaron, who's going to talk in detail about XAPI, and then I think we're going to have some questions at the end of that. Yes. So thank you for listening. Thank you still for being here and for not leaving, um, <laughs> even though we destroyed the, the acting ability. But <laughs> All right. Um, <clears throat> can everybody hear me? I can shout louder if you'd like, because I'm American and that's what we do. There you go. See, laughter, that works. So um, I have a ton of slides to tell you, and I'm going to be really, no, I'm not going to be very technical with you, but, I, but I'm going to breeze through a bunch of information very quickly. These slides will be available so that you can soak them in more. Um, uh, otherwise, I'll begin. So what exactly is XAPI? Um, 
so I can make the most time available for questions uh, in the end. I'm not, that's a rhetorical question. Um, the Experience API is a standard way of talking about our experiences using data. Um, it is, you know, Experience API or XAPI as it's shortened to, is globally recognized official industry name of what was once called tin can. So when you hear the words tin can, if that's how you came in here thinking, you know, understanding what that is, XAPI and tin can are two names for the exact same thing. The common de facto name is XAPI. Um, now, what Martin and Johnny, and I knew it was Johnny, see I was choking. All right, um, what Martin and Johnny were talking about in terms of APIs, in that context, they're using them, they're using these APIs, these publicly accessible APIs, for content authoring and curation, okay? What XAPI, how XAPI fits in the greater context then is for capturing the learner journey through content and the integration of enterprise systems. I mean, they could be educational systems too. My point being that they are, it is for systems integration and capturing the learning journey. You can use it for a whole bunch of other things too, but that's really where its strong suit is. This is essentially the model that, uh, of 4 XAPI. You have social, you have performance support, you have assessments, content, you have stuff. And that stuff is sending data in the format of an actor, a verb, an object, a context, or a result if, if necessary, to a learning record store. And that learning record store, it describes a function. It is not necessarily a product, a standalone product in the enterprise. It could fit inside your, it might be part of your LMS. It might be part of your enterprise resource planning tool. It might be part of your performance support system. It, it, is, it describes a set of functionality. It's like a database with an API you know, endpoint so that you can push data to it and pull data from it. Right? And that data then can be transferred to other learning record stores or other systems and that can be used to power predictive anal algorithms, analytics, feedback loops. Uh, it enables your data, data ownership, finally, and personalization. So I like to think about this context. Marketing uses data about audience behavior to, to reach more people. And product, if any of you worked in a product company, right, they analyze data about the target consumer activity. UX people analyze data about the product usage. Management analyzes business results to understand the company and the market performance, all right? External. Who looks at the data for how the organization runs? That's you. That's L&D, all right? And that's what XAPI enables us to finally do, all right? If it wasn't that you couldn't do this before, but now there's a common way to approach it, all right? So it answers a lot of how type questions. How can I inform better business decisions? How do I avoid locking us into solutions? You know, you know, how many people are on the same LMS they bought 10 years ago because it's, you can't undo the contract? Or because you have so many integrations that have been customized to the rest of your enterprise that the cost of moving on or transitioning to something is difficult. We try to do this so that things can be much more plug and play and modular. How can I make investments in learning development that last longer than our, and are more future-proof? And how can I make sure that what I evaluate today is still useful in the future in terms of your data longevity? And how can I connect the learner's activities across multiple applications where right now, when we talk about the learning experience, that is, for the most part, especially when we're talking about digital, we're talking about one course, one learner. That's the entirety of the experience. So we judge and evaluate success, not the other. Well, I don't know what I just said. <laughs> we evaluate success based on how well this person did with this content, with the assumption that whatever assessment, whatever content you put in there as a designer was already 100% perfect, right? Versus connecting that, what a learner does with one piece of content to another piece of content, to how they talk about it on a bulleted board, to all of those different things, being able to, put, to basically query all of those experiences together talk about the, the totality of the learner experience. So think about the transition of L&D from a content-driven department into a data-driven service, all right? That conversation then shifts from which content should we deliver to our employees to something like what do our people actually need to do and how can, or how can we help them at or before the time of need. So what I'm really talking about here is going from beyond learning as a content-driven experience to performance support, proficiency, 
personalization, performance analytics, talking about one person's performance analytics on the job, scale, how that scales across different divides, time, predictive analytics in terms of like where are they going next, what are the trends in terms of like how people are performing and where, how can we start doing early interventions. And ultimately, in mass, workforce analytics. How, do, uh, how does our company, how do teams actually operate? And what can we do to enable their performance to be better? So, the, the guts of how XAPI works, people interact with stuff, business systems, content, et cetera, apps. And these interactions are observed and described in JSON, and that stuff sends those statements to a learning record store. Again, learning record store and LRS is a database, right? It is software, it can be hardware, it's just a part of data, data appliances. It's not necessarily an, its own product category. It can be, but from the spec side, as we designed and architected this thing, it really describes just a piece of the puzzle, all right? So why you can't read that ludicrously dark text all over the place. There's a number of different functions that an LMS does. The LRS only deals with one thing that your LMS currently does, which is learning records, okay? It's one little subset. So these activity statements are what I would like to talk about as observations. So an actor, verb, object, you've probably heard that whenever somebody talks about XAPI, but it's really about like someone did something. But we could pack a lot more information than that into a statement. We could talk about that they did that to someone or with someone as part of a cohort. Or we could talk about what stuff they were doing with it, you know, at the time, like what apps they were using, what is the greater context, and what was the result of that action, all right? All of that information can be packed and more because we can extend these, uh, these statements as well. So if you've never seen JSON, that's what it looks like, very simply. That is a valid statement. You could copy and paste that if you had the slide on you right now. And it would valid, it'd be, it'd be a valid statement, okay? Actor verb, object, an ID, all right? These things are, for the most part, human readable. They're formatted. It's not very dissimilar from how you've looked at XML probably in the past, all right? And again, that's the actor, verb, object, context result, those lines going to the learning record store and where, how that information feeds and powers other things. That's, that's the, literally the nuts and bolts of what we're talking about. So, one question that you probably interested in is like how ready XAPI really is for enterprise. It's a mixed answer. Let me tell, talk first about like who's actually doing stuff. So Thomson Reuters is using XAPI as a training overlay. They're building performance support systems that are in line with the actual work products. They, in this case study, case study, not use case, this is actual implementation. Their Westlaw product is like used by like hundreds of thousands of lawyers around, or you know, lawyers around the world, or people learning to be lawyers. Um, and its system is fairly complex web-based software. And so they now have performance support built in line, which is a layer on top of the actual application. There are business process that, processes that are associated with that application. The 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 cues of what people, should, when people might need help are dynamically generated based on what those business processes are. And it, and there is, it, it basically it just provides content at the point of need in the application itself. And all of this is being tracked through XAPI and powered by the data in XAPI. PJM, it controls 20% of the United States' energy grid, right? They're an energy company. They have people who work in, you know, the front lines on, on electricity, electrical lines, stuff like that. They have a, gas lines, et cetera. They have a lot of, like, highly sensitive compliance-based content. And they have a lot of performance support aids because, as you can imagine, working in the high-stakes environment, there's a lot of stuff you have to get right, right? We have seen the cost of what happens when you don't do something right. So rather than have binders and binders full of printed manuals, they basically created a PDF where the LMS is the document control mechanism for making sure people re only have access to the documents they're supposed to, right? Your LMS does this pretty well. Um, what they did, though, was build an application to actually take those PDFs, just regularly published PDFs, nothing special done to them, build an application to basically 
read them on your phone the way that you use a Kindle. You could highlight, you could make notes. Pretty simple stuff. All of that data is stored as, as, XAP, as activity statements via XAPI and then re-aggregated from a reporting side so that the document owners can actually see how are these documents actually being used? What is being highlighted? What are the things that are annotated? Are, and then read what those annotations are. Are they corrections that we need to use to modify these documents? Are there hundreds of pages in the middle of the document that nobody even looks at? Content analytics are a pretty common use case for XAPI. National Lewis University, all right? They are using XAPI in order to like, help manage the learning experiences of student teachers. These are, teacher, these are teacher candidates who have gone through university and are now kind of in their internship where they are actually in the classroom in front of students and they have lots of observations. But in order for them to be the kind of teachers that National Lewis University wants to turn out, right, the there needs to be some tailored interventions in terms, in terms of like, you know, addressing their weak spots. Right? And maybe it's classroom management, or maybe it's, it's honestly a mastery of material that they're like math, that they're just not into. All right? And so using, using these dashboards to make evaluations, to push content and suggest things to the learner, and then being able to record and micro-credential as they, as they continue on their journey towards graduation, this path, this path is being looked at pretty, pretty strongly, and it's rolling out into other programs at National Lewis. The McKinsey Social Initiative is a massive um, social in initiative <laughs> um, from McKinsey and Company. And they're focusing on closing the skills needed in you know, young people around the world, especially in poverty-stricken areas, right, so that they can actually turn their lives around you know, in terms of like, their earning capacity, their learning capacity. Right? And they're using XAPI in order to pull information about how that person is developing from multiple sources together in a massive 10-year project spanning six different countries right now. All right. The University of Central Florida is, has an app for um, helping people coming back from uh, you know, so their service, you know, US, U.S. soldiers, uh, in screening for depression. And so what they're doing is looking at how people are using the app, and based on the analytics they're pulling from XAPI, they're making recommendations for content, for new content to be pushed to them, uh, you know, based on, I guess, performance analytics. Um, there, there is a project at a hands-on museum. It's, very, it's a children's museum where you can basically touch and play with everything in the museum. Um, the, where, based on the student's RFE, R, RFID tag when they walk in, because student data must be anonymized, especially in K-12 or K-8 scenarios uh, in the U.S. Um, but they can map like that this student B, you know, did these things, they played with these features, they, they performed on these different types of manipulatives, and those associate to certain common core criteria from a curricular standpoint. And so they can, teachers can then get a full report out after a day, spending a day or an afternoon at the museum with their class and actually, find, and actually uncover what requirements to the curriculum they've, those students have achieved. All right. So we have a ton of case studies on connectionsforum.com. We, we, have, we have a ton of case studies and more in-depth articles about like what's really happening with XAPI on the xapiquarterly.com. Um, now... The, I told you that before in terms of how ready, enterprise ready is XAPI, and I said it's kind of a mixed answer. There are a lot of people doing some very innovative or at least, you know, I would say interesting things with XAPI. Certainly more interesting than just, you know, publishing content and putting it into an LMS. Um, but there are some significant challenges that need to be addressed. Um, there's basically two big ones, uh, and you probably wouldn't be aware of them unless somebody just told you, like I'm about to tell you. Um, one is the dealing with vocabulary sets. If you're going to create, uh, generate all of this data, you're eventually going to want to use it to, for something. It might be reports, it might be to feed into predictive analytics, it might be to, you know, aggregate into looking at the entire uh, cohort versus just one, one employee or a student. Um, at any rate, when you start having to deal with multiple sources, right, that are developed independently, much the same way where as you 
you may work in a company that buys its content from several different content providers, and it never quite looks the same, no matter how, what your branding guidelines are. Um, this is, th we have a challenge where like, we can describe how one watches video in three, different, three or four different ways that are, are all official and are all maybe considered canon or standard or de facto standards, um, but they're not actually the same vocabulary sets. They're not actually the same identical profiles. And therefore, you have to understand how to actually marry these things together when you want to actually look at what it, what, how many people watched videos, for example, or not just head counting, but how those videos relate to other larger activity sets. All right. So um, one, what is happening is, you know, this is, XAPI is a specification. It's not a standard yet, right? And the specification has been stewarded by Advanced Distributed Learning Initiative. It's a part of the U.S. Department of Defense. It's been that way since we began that project in 2010. Um, but it is now so big with so much moment, momentum that it is impossible for the DOD, the U.S. DOD, to shoulder the burden of maintaining this on its own. So they've, they, as well as vendors, as well as you know, larger organizations who are now putting in incredible stakes and investments in doing XAPI, have asked a few people to actually put together a consortium that will focus on its evolution and standard is in eventually its standardization. So that's what the that's what the data interoperability standards consortium does. Okay. Um, when I talked about how this is a specification, not a standard, right? We're not racing for standardization because there's still things that are probably going to change. Uh, so, example: How many people here have heard of Internet of Things? Everybody. Awesome. How powerful do you think each little tiny little processor is? Not very, right? So we can't shoot tons and tons of loaded data about whatever is going on out of each of these systems without basically just jamming up the pipes. So there needs to be similar ways of describing the data in terms of what the data model is, actor, verb, object, et cetera, but it needs actually a different means to move that data around where JSON works really well for web-based systems, right, as web services, there are things such as low energy Bluetooth, which, you know, you think about Bluetooth as like some kind of format for connecting your, your devices together. It also has like a communications mechanism, obviously, and be able to, the ability to pass information through that is something that has not been defined by the XAPI community, but it needs to be if we want to start pulling in data from Internet of Things. How many people work in old, with old legacy systems in their, in their organizations that maybe are all dependent on uh, XML? You wouldn't even know, so that's cool. But a couple of small hands up there, that's cool. Um, chance, guess what? XAPI doesn't work with XML, all right? Because it was written with a modern infrastructure in mind. But in order to retrofit systems, there's probably going to be some interest in making that happen. And so we know that things about XAPI are prone to change. There are, there are, every nation has slightly different security and privacy guidelines, and they have to be accounted for and catered to. And so figuring out where all those things lie gives us to evolution of the spec and eventually then to standardization. Once we, have, once we get to a point where we, have to, we can stop making so many changes that break things, then we can actually start standardizing the spec and go through IEEE and ISO and a whole bunch of other acronym names. Um, and I'm sorry for if I'm going on too long. Anyway, what we're going to address this year, vocabulary, profiles, the partnerships with different organizations, JISC being one of them, JISC is your educational technology kind of recommendations group within the US, UK government, um, so, software certification, stewardship. Um, I'm not going to go into all this stuff because it's not really important. Anyway, I, there, I'm, I'm the fat guy second from the right. Um, and we have, a, we have a board of directors that come, some from the learning analytics field and mostly from business and other, other, for, uh, other places other than learning because the stakeholders for what we're talking about with XAPI are far bigger than learning. We may be starting here, but we're really talking about pulling, finding out how we empower people from, their, from the evolution from them as students to them as contributors to, the, to economies and, and contributors to democracies. So our year one deliverables for DISC are going to be certification, requirements, licensing, et cetera. Um, if you want to find out more information on that, it's at datainteroperability.org. And thank you. All right. Thank you. So, 
Questions? Shoot. Start with there. Come to you. Hi, this is for Aaron, actually, before you went away. Um, I saw Megan Bow's name on there. She spoke here a couple of years ago. She used to work at Rustacy. Yes. What's She's happening? not at Rustacy Software anymore. Okay. And uh, they were, was Tin Can originally their implementation of XAPI? How did that work? So, all right. So here's, the, here's a little bit of history, okay? Uh, I was with ADL at the time where there was a BAA program where what you would call it's like a grant program, right? Um, Rusty Software submitted a white paper. We put out requirements of like things we were kind of looking for. They put in a white paper that suggested uh, a model that we could approach that looked very similar to what we were thinking internally. They were selected uh, out of the candidates that, uh, that were that applied for that BAA program. Um, and so they, they first did a bunch of user research, and then they did a prototype based on activity streams as a, spe as a specification. We went to the activity streams collectively and said, hey, we, like to, we love activity streams as a spec, but there's some things you're not doing, and we'd like to, we'd like to expand it. Would you be willing to do so? Because that's what it says in their, in their little bylaws, that we'll accommodate a, a user community. They didn't accommodate. And so we ended up having to roll our own, which is fine because ironically now activity streams basically copied us. Now they're doing all the same things too. Um, that's how standards work. Um, so at any rate, uh, Tin Can, Project Tin Can was their implementation, all right? But the spec itself, the source is all owned by a ADL and it's licensed as Apache 2. So if anybody, anybody can take, take a XAPI as is and create a derivative work if they wanted to. That help? I may have been asked that question before. <laughs> Hi, um, so I'm Christian Vanberg. I do HR tech. Um, I've dealt a lot with uh, CV portability, CV data portability. I'm sorry? Uh, I've dealt a lot with CV portability. CV portability, yeah, awesome. So for example, in European Union, you have the portable CV standard. Interesting. Uh, not very big success story. I but want to know all have it. I want to know all about it. But yeah, no, it's, it's, right it's brilliant. <laughs> it's very interesting. Uh, and one word I didn't see once was uh, portability. Yeah. Uh, I believe that if I have a job, mm -hmm. I learn, like one, one thing is a line in my CV. Mm -hmm. What we're talking about in the future is I'll have, you know, maybe 100,000 data points about what I did in a job. Yes. Now that's my data, the way I see it. Yeah. How do I take that with me? And I just think there's a technical side to it, there's a legal side to it, there's an yeah. IP side to it, there's a trade, trade secret side to it. Yeah. Uh, it is anyone on that wall yet? Yeah. So. Kirst, Dr. Kirsty Kiddo uh, is with Queensland University. She's very much into the data pathways approach. We brought her on the board because Megan and I, um, we really feel very strongly about data ownership at the individual level. You cannot have agency and, uh, and accountability in a, in, in a digital democracy without being able to own and control your own data. But how that actually manifests from organizations with their IP policies, et cetera, um, how that manifests the, the, the struggle between I did these things as a human and therefore this data is all about me and it's mine versus I as an organization created or I as a vendor or whatever created the means to even generate this data that you voluntarily participated in. That data belongs to me. And so that's, that is a real struggle that we are going to have. It's going to be an ongoing conversation. But yes, the reason why we have Kirsty Kiddo on the board is to push us to make sure that that actually does happen. The okay. Privacy by Design um, initiative that we have is one of the three core pillars. Like we have dedicated research projects around these issues because it's exactly the same if you take kids in school, in university. So that's why our cross-sectoral approach is important because you start that learning at a very early stage in your, in your life. And all those things that you go through you want to be able to bring those with you. So again, there isn't an answer there, but I would say there's, a, there's research projects and we can do those independent of organizational challenges. Yes. All we can do then is share the, that research and then the organizations can take that and try and build from that. Indeed. And there's some company stuff that you don't, that you keep, but the completion record stays with the user. And then the idea is just like your LinkedIn profile travels with you, so does your learning record. It's called Achieved. Uh, Achieve.co. It's, it's a fun group of guys. They haven't figured out how to monetize it yet, but uh, it's, uh, it's, it's a cool little project. Donald will help them with that. I think, I think there's two bits there. There's one is access to that data, and then the other piece is ownership of that data. Those are the 
I mean, and that's, yeah. the, that's the trick of it, right? And that's what you're referring to, is right? because it's fine to have access to that data, so the interoperability piece takes care of that, but it's who owns that data, and is the legislation that's currently in place, for example, keeping track with the kind of changes that is being driven here, because by definition, most legislation policymakers are way behind the kind of technology changes that are coming through, so. Hi there. Uh, I'm old enough to remember presentations like this when SCORM came on the market. And, and Sorry. <laughs> uh, it was a long time ago, but one of the things that happened there was it ha started with a learning objects thing from Wayne Hodgkins, and then IEEE got the standard, then IMS, then ADL. And one of the unfortunate things is it was the process was a bit hijacked, I think, by the reusable learning object model, which Wayne was obsessed by, yeah. but he never consulted other people. And the American military thing cramped down on it. So we ended up with a really crap thing, yep. uh, to be honest. And I, I, it's just a word of warning here in terms oh. of the panel of these things, because I, I've, let's have a fixed vocabulary. I just wonder who the people are doing this, because really you should be really big time crowdsourcing and getting information from the market. And I, 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 this is a great opportunity here to really get rid of that nonsense that yeah. we've had through SCORM. So, but let, it won't be if it's too narrow cast. So allow me to explain, let me go into that in detail because that's actually a very important distinction. There are standards out there that do things like what XAPI is doing, all right? Their focus though is very, very narrow, all right? I'm not gonna name names, but you can probably guess if you Google who they are. Um, and their focus is, is on a very particular market, with a, and they have a very fixed vocabulary. Now, that makes a lot of the things that we're talking about in terms of data interoperability very easy. It becomes a very turnkey solution, but then you have to buy in to every decision that has been made in that ecosystem for it all to work, right? That's a very, that becomes, eventually, a very constraining box. What we have done deliberately since 0.95 of the spec is pull the embedded vocabulary out of the spec. Now, that makes things really damn hard for, implement for implementers and practitioners. What that enables, though, is the flexibility for XAPI to be used by more than just learning and development, to be used by HR, to be used by construction, to be used by Internet of Things for a variety of contexts, right? And so those communities, of there are communities of practice where people who are, want to talk about how we describe watching video are getting together to define that that profile. There are folks who want to do things like what SCORM did. Uh, they're, they're a group called CMI5. They grew out of the AICC organization, if you need a trivia question there. Um, and they're describing a vocabulary set for in a profile in a way in which you package content that works fully with XAPI, right? Um, we're encouraging, data interoperability is going to continue to encourage and grow and invest in those communities of practice. And what one of the things that, that we are, is our focus for this year, aside from software certification, is making it easier for practitioners to do the right things with data. And that requires us to be able to come up with like a schema to st almost standardize the way in which communities of practice define their profiles and their vocabulary sets so that we can then make web services through an API available to people through two software providers as well, to just make it easier for you to find exactly the data, that you, the, to create the data that you want to collect. We, we had this conversation yesterday with Lunch. Like, there's a real danger of a desire to standardize, right? So if you, like, the race to standardize is a race to the bottom because you, you will end up just throwing a blanket over everything and you will exclude all of the good stuff that could be possible to like but there is a dance between standardization yeah. and ca complete chaos. And, so, and it is a dance. It is a give and a take. It is a conversation. It's not going to be the exact same way for every single context and situation. So we're hoping to create the global table that has not existed yet for XAPI, where communities, different communities of practice, whoever you are from wherever you're from, can come together and actually figure stuff out how to solve these problems. And one of the things that, that, like this is a challenge that we identified that if you're the developer, and particularly if you're a developer within an organization that may serve different, so you're a third party, you have different organizational clients who are gonna have different systems. So I suppose our goal is to try and see, can we, can we give the developer a layer that sits on top of all of these other um, solutions? So that if, if you've got XAPI, you might have IMS, you might have other standards, and that we wanna try and have, like in the search example, that you've got a store record uh, 
command in, in our API, and then you say whether you would want, in this instance, it to be uh, XAPI compliant or if it wanted to be IMS compliant or whatever, and that we've done the work to knit those together, but just making it easier, again, for the developers. So just really abstracting it one level up for the developers with, with a real understanding of the technology and service. The best, the best analogy I had was somebody who described it as, it's like a language, right? You can go off and write a health and safety booklet if you want for the language, but, but you can also write poetry. We don't all want to write health and safety booklets, right? But that's, if you want to do that, you can do that, and then you can do that in a very standardized way. But let's have the flexibility to allow some of us to go off and write poetry. So that's kind of, I think that's, if you move away from the point that interoperability is, is the aim, because it's not, we just take that as a given. Because you're going back to your point, what you were talking about earlier around, around AI, a lot of that interoperability around understanding the meaning of data actually doesn't need standards anymore because we have the computational power to actually infer meaning anyway, right? So. It's, uh, that dance is the, is the tricky one. Yeah, that last point is really important. Yeah, yeah. Any other question? Oh, thank you. Anything? No? All right, everybody, let's go drink. Yeah. <laughs> Again. Thank you all for staying. You're yeah, yeah, yeah. the best people thank in you. the building. Thank you. Thank you.